and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. I'm a man who is very well seasoned in the in the realm of both fiction writing and um, tabletop writing, and now is go now is going whole hog with a full on setting material in the form of the Eye of Everywhere. The one and only Alan Tucker. How you doing today, man? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I am do I am doing good. Um, I had thought I had thought there was going to be more storms coming, but it looks like looks like not in my area, which is good. I don't need I don't need an, I don't need another b bunch of fallen trees to deal with. <laughs> yeah, we had a whole bunch of wind here this afternoon, but it's calmed down now, so that's good. Yeah, I've I've told other I've told this elsewhere, but there was a nasty um, thunderstorm that hit that hit my area last week. And when I say nasty, it was starting to mimic the effects of a tropical storm. Mm. So there are a bunch, there are a few big trees in the in the back that got knocked over and completely cut me off from the backyard. That's and not good. While I could ne while I could probably squeeze through them, they're evergreen trees. I'm not I'm not brushing with that. No kidding. You no, know, all all of those spikes and all that. But For sure. I'd like to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Uh, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Okay. Um, well, that was back when dinosaurs walked the Earth in the early 80s. Um, and I actually had a, a group of friends that played... And I, at the time, I just thought, oh, man, that's stupid. Why would you do that? And But they finally roped me in at one point, and uh, it wasn't too long after that that I started DMing and, and everything else. So, mm -hmm. But we played uh, we played all kinds of games, not just Dungeons and Dragons, but we played the Marvel superheroes and uh, Top Secret. Uh, if you've ever heard of that one, that was I a James Bond-ish, you know, James Bond kind of game. and. Mm -hmm. Where we just we just did it all and and had a great time doing it. Um, consumed far too much soda and and everything else and playing way far into the night, which I could never do it at these days. But it was sure fun back then. Mm -hmm. But I just really loved creating stories. I think more than anything and. Um, took a I took a long break. Um, just because of life from uh, well, early early 90s until uh, about 2016, 17, um, when I was an empty nester and, and decided to pick it up again and see what was going on, got into 5th edition and discovered it was really quite a bit like 2nd uh, edition that I had played, only more streamlined and, and made more sense. <laughs> didn't have a lot of the fiddly bits and yeah just kept on going from there started writing I'd, i had written some several novels fantasy and science fiction before um and then once i got back into playing decided well i can i can do this and and put some stuff up on this dm's guild thing that i had just, just discovered so started doing that and just been doing it ever since Mm -hmm. Um. Although when you met, when you mentioned fiddly bits, I meet my mind immediately went to Thaco. That was one of the fiddly bits. <laughs> also, um, doing having segments to rounds and uh, initiative based on weapon speed and things like that. That's a lot. There's a lot of fiddly bits that really weren't necessary. <laughs> yeah, even even with people who do throwback versions of. Of different versions of of different takes on um, pre three E D and D and D, I rarely see a, a whole lot of people handle um, handle weapon speed. 
Yeah. That was that was a bear for sure. And it's definitely don't miss that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, like I, I appreciate the I appreciate the idea. I just think I just think it was I just think it wasn't done properly. Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, yeah, like you say, I appreciate the idea. I think there's there is some merit in in doing that in trying to figure out that well this this weapon's faster. You should be going before the other this, this guy with the mile long pike, but um, it certainly slows gameplay down. <clears throat> doing those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And in my in in my in my particular case, um I cer I certainly don't I certainly don't miss trying to figure out okay, how am I supposed to work this whole three attacks every two turns thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I had forgotten about that. But you're right. Yeah, that was another one that was a that was a bear to take care of and and keep track of. I mean, eventually I figured it out, but the path to get there was harder than it needed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will admit that. I don't hate Thaco, I just hate the way it was explained. Mm -hmm. Well, that, well, that, and, I, the, that and the it's, whole... Oh, good. Yeah, you know, I was just going to say, the idea, to me too, the idea of armor class being better as the number went down is... I mean, we, we made do with it then, but it, it's really counterintuitive. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, somebody having a negative five armor class was something that was really, really good. And I think, that... I think some of that is just is just a product of psychology. Um, it's hard it's harder for people to grasp the idea of lower of lower equals better. Mm -hmm. But the other problem the other problem that I remember having and a lot of these problems are kind of artifacts of the miniature wargaming days that just weren't taken out due to tradition in my view is yeah. is think is um <laughs> like I already I already mentioned Thaco but the but the whole the whole collection of subsystems instead instead of a unified resolution Maybe it's just me, but I've had the I've had the mindset of if you're gonna have a roll high system, all die should be roll high. If you're gonna have a roll low system, all die should be roll low. Yeah, yeah. Making making one it roll low for one thing and one roll high for another is just adds adds unneeded complexity for sure. I'm no, I'm no, I'm perfectly fine with complexity. Um. Uh, it's, it's what it's complete, but there's a right and a wrong way to do it. And what you don't do is do it for its own sake. That's, that's what happened with a lot of, with a lot of the really bad, um, skill centric games in the eight, in the eighties and nineties where they thought, let's make, let's make it as detailed as possible and add all the skills. Mm -hmm. But. It's now that brings me to the eye of everywhere. It's certainly it's certainly quite a leap to go from a lot of tr a lot of the more traditional ends of fantasy to go to going with a sci to going with a um sci-fi fantasy almost space opera. Um what made you go what made you want to go the route of sci of mixing science fiction and fantasy in this regard? Well, that's kind of a lot of the, the novels that I read those veins, some some more fantasy, some more sci-fi, but all of them had had kind of a mix of both. And I've just always enjoyed that sort of thing. And and uh, things like Star Wars, I mean that's you you've got you've got magic wielding knights 
running around with with laser swords with you know with other people having blasters and spaceships and and everything else and i just to me it's i i love the it's it's a beautiful chaos i guess more than anything with that to have to have all of those things put together yeah i can i can certainly get behind that um and i do f i do find it funny that you put that you put it in the, you put that little aside in the um on the, i was going to say kickstarter but it's game found yeah. habits but <laughs> i um, understand the whole you got chocolate in my pe in my peanut butter um yeah. but ha in your experience ha did you deal with it did you deal with pushback as far as mixing fantasy and sf well, honestly, when I was younger and I first started playing, I really disliked the idea of things like having firearms in um, in the Dungeons and Dragons game um, that we played because um, we had two of the players like to to do that and mess with you know flintlocks and those types of things that they had kind of introduced at that point and. Mm -hmm. I was I was pretty much a purist at that point, but as I as I got older, like I said, with with uh, Star Wars, and I mean, there's just so many things out there um, the, between movies, TV shows, video games, all of that stuff that just are a, are, a com are a complete blend of fantasy and sci-fi. I've really come to just enjoy the uh, the mix and thinking about, well, gosh, you know what? And especially like a contemporary world, like it would be to me, it would just be super cool to be able to have magic as well as all the technology and things like that that we have today so mm -hmm. that's what i guess attracts me to it <clears throat> and i can i can completely understand that um now when it comes to when it come now with that with that in mind i get the feeling that you especially with the with the faction system that you introduced, you didn't want to just do um, 5e in space. Right. Um, so how, how did factions come about? Like, were you, were, was it a case of wanting to use that to put more, to put more life into the system? Into the uh, setting, I should say. Well, yeah, that's, that's kind of where it started. And I think, in my experience, at least, players get more in, more involved and into your world if there are things to interact with. Um, and so if you have just right off the bat, you say, here's, here's a bunch of these factions They're They're kind of into different things. Um, and if you want to uh, be a part of one of these factions, then in addition, you're also going to get some benefits from that mm -hmm. in a in a game sense. Um, I think it's it gets players a little more invested um, from the get go instead of just having a you know big lore dump uh, at the at the beginning in your session zero or whatever you want to do mm -hmm. uh, to get the players prepped for for what they're going into. Yeah. Now. With, and of course, what I noticed with the, with the faction setup that you have is the skill association as well as um, benefit as well as benefits at certain levels. Right. Uh, now, with that in mind, was an, I'm guessing you made an effort to make sure that the benefits weren't too leaning towards certain classes. That was, that's the intent, yeah. I mean, there's some obviously that are, if you're if you're a particular class, um, you're going to be uh, you're going to be definitely more inclined to go with you know one faction or another. But there's um, again, I wanted to make sure that everybody had a wide variety of things to to be able to look at or, or take into account mm -hmm. with these. Um, the other, 
Now, the other question that I'd ha I have, it, and normally this would be so this would be something that I that I wouldn't bring up except except given recent events. I can't. I feel like I have to. Um, has anyone br has anyone brought up Spelljammer to you when oh, when doing I, the, I've when doing the elevator pitch? <laughs> Uh, in that, you know, I started working, I actually started developing this a little over two years ago. And, you know, obviously people had talked about Spelljammer then, um, but it was obviously, you know, at that point, it seemed like it was going to be down the road quite a bit um, for wizards to be doing. But um, I, I initially, I wanted to, to um, put this out for crowdfunding last year um but i got i uh, got together actually with an artist that that i went to school with and been buddies with for a long long time and and he really wanted to do the um do some art for this and for the just to, to showcase the eye itself that's what's on the the cover and, and some mm -hmm. the um game found page that you see there and unfortunately, he he took ill for for several months and wasn't able to to do anything on it. And so I kind of put everything on hold. Um, and then, of course, we had recently had the announcement with Spelljammer and everything else. And I thought, I thought, well, okay, I've still been I've been working on this forever, and and it still is, I think, flavor wise, quite a bit different from Spelljammer. Spelljammer is still much more rooted in fantasy, mm -hmm. um, whereas this is much more of a blend of, of sci-fi and fantasy. So I think there's they're similar, yes, but I still think there's a there's a place for both. So, yeah. and with the spell, when it comes to the um, that mix between that mix between sci-fi and fantasy, would you say that a lot of games a lot of games that purport mixing of that um, have a, have a little bit much of one and not, and not a whole lot of the other. Well, yeah, that, I mean that's probably that's probably normal, um, and I guess I mean that's one thing that I wanted to try to do with this was to make to have a whole lot of both, um, and hopefully hopefully we've accomplished that, but. Um, that that's also it. In the other thing with this is to be is to have it be flexible. Mm -hmm. And so, if you have a group that really wants to focus a little more on the fantasy side, you can still use this setting um, as a as a jumping off point, um, and still do you know your dragon hunts and you know anything else that you want to do with it, or on the other other hand you if you have somebody that wants to you know be a group of space marines going out on, you know behind into space and having a bug hunt or whatever there was one that they want to do you can do that with this as well mm -hmm. and anything in between and i i can i can certainly get that and and well just remember it's never just a bug hunt <laughs> I'm a big Aliens fan, so that was always one of my favorite lines from that from that movie. <laughs> I hope to God you never tried to play the Aliens RPG. Not That's the one that came I, out yeah. recently, but the one that came out in the 90s. Yeah, no, I, that one I missed. That was kind of during the time where I wasn't really gaming a whole lot, so I missed a lot of stuff. I missed uh, I missed third and fourth editions of D&D, &D and then yeah, a whole lot of other stuff in, in between, but I've been trying to catch myself up as time goes. Mm -hmm. Um, but the the Aliens Adventure game, as it was called, is one of my whipping boys because it you because of how excessively crunchy it could get. Mm. Uh, and I usually tell people if they if they want to do something Aliens related, just gr if they want with the official name and all that. Just grab the free league version and don't look back. <laughs> <laughs> but give now. I did. I did see that in within the preview document there were a few subclasses. Are you planning on giving 
um, subclass material to all of the base classes? Um, no, I've only done I've only done ones that I thought made sense really so far, um, and that was mostly the the fighter and the rogue. Mm-hmm. Um, the fighter is a field tech, which is somebody you're you're kind of MacGyver uh, was the idea, and then the rogue is a is a slicer, which is you know obviously a kind of a computer nerd um, who happens to be good with knives and things like that. So mm-hmm. uh, the warlock patron is actually something that I came up with um, for incredible creatures, which is a, a book that I did uh, last year and uh, had fun with, and it seemed to fit. Uh, it seemed to fit the, uh, the feel for eye of everywhere. So I went ahead and included it uh, in this as well. Because it's kind of a the, the patron is is basically a monster of chaos, um, and again that like I said seemed to kind of fit the bill <laughs> for for this. So, but as far as other subclasses, I don't have any plans at this point. If I if if myself or some of the other writers come up with something in the meantime, you know we'll certainly look at that and and get those included. But it wasn't yeah. That. I um if you if you hadn't said anything I w- I would have gone through the list of the base classes and see what and um see which of those which of, which of those would e- either have trouble fitting into the setting or or uh, might not might not work for um subclass support right cuz some of them I can, some of them I can definitely see being a bit of a stretch the barbarian being one example of that. Mm-hmm. Um, druid, druid is. I suppose. I suppose it all. I suppose it all depends when it comes to the druid. I. Um. The rain. The um. But it, I would. I would have brought up the artificer, but that's setting specific. So that's so that's automatically out. Right. Um, and the well, the bard would need to actually be useful first. <laughs> <laughs> um, same thing goes for the ranger. Yeah, that was like I said. That was kind of where where we were at too. It it made sense. I mean, there's always going to be. It doesn't matter what you're doing. There's going to be fighters. Of some type, and so it made sense to do a, a more techie fighter version. And then um, I considered, I mean, I wanted to have some sort of um, computer computer hacker kind of um, character, and Rogue just seemed to be the best fit for that. And so that's that's where we ended up with it. Now I'd also seen that you're at that you're adding a scion class. Yep. Which is which um does make me laugh because of what happened when Wizards of the Coast tried to introduce psionics in, into 5e and completely got roasted for how they did it. Mhm. Yeah, it didn't make a lot of sense to me to have it be subclasses. Um and again, it's it's funny because this was another thing that I really I really bounced off of when I was younger. But um, I think I especially for this setting, I really it it just makes sense to to have it. Um, and I wanted to I wanted to make something that you could you could flavor a character as as a Jedi if you wanted. You could make them Eleven from Stranger Things if you wanted, um, or you know any other kind of mind. Uh, mind character that you can think of, um, and so that's kind of where I was going with this. But to me, I, I started out with a system that was that was not um, that was not based in spells. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me, but um, it seemed like most of the feedback I got was it was too different, and so I went back to a more of a spell um, spell based thing. Uh, but it still has its own flavor, I think. Yeah. Uh, and while I've been critical of the of um, 
of the spe of the um, spell charges the whole thing that's uh, that that admittedly is another matter I'll, although the re one of the reasons I picked on Wizards of the Coast's take on the take on the scion was because their argument was oh a, a scion is just a wizard who casts spells with their mind no no yeah <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah, that's that's a sorcerer, <laughs> is what you're thinking of there, wizards. So, yeah, that, to me, that was one thing that I had a hard time with coming back and with 5th edition was the, the sorcerer and the warlock. To me, that they, they should have been one class, and they, they shouldn't have been... They, we, we don't need two charisma casters. That was, that to me, that was a weird uh weird thing to do but anyway that's yeah. neither here nor there <laughs> so, sorcerers have come a significantly long long way from their origins um cuz in 3rd edition they were they were the butt of they were the butt of a few jokes it wasn't until 3.5 and, and a little bit after that that they started to um redeem that redeem their reputation a bit there's a bit of a there's a bit of an old wives tale that um one of the, that one of the higher up devs for um third edition absolutely despised sorcerers I don't know exactly what it was that he hated about them but he di but he certainly did <laughs> And now when it comes to the even though there is a bit of a spell basis when it comes to um sci when it comes to psionics um it if i'm reading this correctly you are taking a point based approach with their casting instead of charges correct yeah i decided to me it was more it was more flexible and um i didn't again i wanted to get away from from uh spells and it, it, again the just the flexibility made more sense this way and and trying to get away from the um spell slot uh, mechanic mm -hmm. so we have points um but i think to me one of the things i'm most proud of on this is is trying to really i wanted to make a constitution based caster now this isn't its primary stat is intelligence, which again I just kind of ended up with because it made the most sense. But you you also want to have a good Constitution score for this because anytime you use your powers, um, depending on what what level you're using them at, you uh, you roll a a damage die. Uh, and then subtract your constitution modifier, and then you take that much damage. Mm -hmm. um, at low levels, it, it usually ends up being nothing. But as you're doing more powerful things, it's more, it puts more strain on your body. And, and like I said, with all of the all of the characters that you th can think of in in movies and comics and everything else, it's it's always a there's there's effort involved in what they're doing, um, and I wanted to you know make a game mechanic to reflect that. Um, and at least so far in playtesting, it seems to work. I think it's 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 done pretty well. So. Mm -hmm. So. The the other thing that I could, that I couldn't help but notice is the dis is the way you're handling um. Disciplines. Mm -hmm. Um. Now it, I think a a cursory a cursory glance could could create the assumption that the, that your you that you're using disciplines the same way in a similar way to um, spheres of ma spheres of casting. But from what I from what I understand, it's more of the setup is more that there's no there there's no limit to what um psionic powers you can get it's just that certain ones you're going to be better at using 
Right. Yeah, you get you you choose a a primary discipline uh, right off the bat, um, and then it isn't until seventh level that you can choose a secondary discipline. Um, and but you start, you only get the the lowest level of abilities with that, and then it begins to progress as well. But you're you're always going to be your primary discipline is always going to be your most um, the thing that you advance the farthest with. Mm -hmm. And then later on at 14th level, you get a tertiary third discipline. Um, but again, you, you, you start out with that at the lowest level of, um, of ability. And so again, it was more of a, you know, as you as you grow and, and become more powerful, you're not, you get much, much better at this particular discipline, but you also kind of bleed out into some other things as well. Yeah. Um, and because of that, I'm get I'm guessing that there's not really subclasses for psionics, or is that or there's or do you have subclasses right. planned? No, this this is this is pretty well what I've got here. There, there's four different disciplines, so no no psion can ever can ever you know branch out into ev into everything. Um, but I think in what we have, in, and they are, um, there's divulgation, mm -hmm. which is um, telepathy, foresight, the ability to force others to see things that aren't there, illusions, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, there's intercision, which is uh, teleportation, extra planar movement, summoning of creatures and manifestation of items, uh, and even some time manipulation. Um, there's kinesis, which is, uh, more, you know, moving, moving things with your mind, jumping, flying, energy manipulation, things like that. Mm -hmm. Those kind of the traditional sorts of Jedi powers that you think of most often. And then morphology, which is more of uh, body, uh, biology, environment, that type of thing, uh, healing as well. So, mm -hmm. oh. Now, I had seen I had seen in the thing that you that you get all of the zero and first level ability abilities from your primary, as well as as well as one as well as one wild card at zeroth. Um, is when it comes to when it comes to getting new when it comes to getting new spells, is it? Is it a case of get of getting them at certain le at certain levels? How did you, in, how did you intend on ha on handling, um, getting new spells or getting them at higher tiers? Yeah, well, so you as you progress, um, your first and second level, you can only use the the zero cantrip level spells and first level spells or powers. Then at third, the the progression actually works pretty similar to how you advance in. Uh, spell levels that for a caster, and so at third level you get access to to second level uh, powers. Fifth level you get access to third level, etc. Um, and it progresses the same um, as you go with your with your primary discipline. Um, the secondary and tertiary don't progress. <coughs> Pardon me don't progress the same, but again, they start out at one, and you stay at one for a little while, then you go to two, three, etc. The highest you can progress in the secondary, uh, 20th level would be f fifth level secondary powers, and then for your tertiary discipline, the highest you can progress in that is third. Mm -hmm. Now, now, the other, one of the other, um, one of the other things that I'm cu I'm curious about, as far as as far as why you put why you put it in, is the concept of personal psych psychic damage. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm and I'm guessing that I'm guessing this is the reason why you had said that this is a constitu that this is a constitution leaning caster. Um, for what reason did you go did you go with the idea that, um. 
Scions using their power causes them to take damage. Well, it isn't. I mean, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a narrative thing, um, and and again, it, to me, it was more of a psionics is a is a mental effort, and so uh, damage isn't necessarily um, you know getting stabbed or something like that, but it is. It's hit points. I mean, are are also a a measure of your stamina. Um, and so what you're doing, if you, if you take a little bit of damage, um, when you're expending the effort to, to do this particular power that you're, that, um, that you're trying to do, you take a little bit of damage. That's, that's kind of representing the, the, the effort and the strain that it's putting on, on your body in order to make it happen. Um, Again, to me, it just with with mind powers, almost always. If you like, I said, if you look at eleven, uh, you know she's she's bleeding from the nose. She's taking, you know, she's she's physically taking damage. You can see as as she's doing things. Um, if you look at uh, somebody like Professor X from the comic books, there that's always a, you know, it's a struggle. They they sweat. They're you know they're uh, doing sorts of. Uh, straining to to do these powerful things um and even even like with the the jedi from star wars you're if they're doing something that's that's quite uh extraordinary generally it, it saps them um for a time and they have to stop and, and rest or whatever to be able to continue on so that was the the flavor that i wanted to evoke with this and that seemed like the best way to do it and what I d what I did notice is that some if if I'm looking at the list properly, there are there are some that are psionic versions of of established spells. Correct. Yeah, there are some some spell. They're just straight spells, um, just because it simply made sense to to include them um, for the particular discipline. And then there are some. That are just are brand new abilities, and then there, like you say, there are some that are psionic versions of that particular spell, mostly because um, the maybe the concentration aspect of it is different. Or um, I've also a lot of these powers have different things that they can do at different levels. So not only when you progress in and you get get to a point where you are being able to use third level powers for instance um, you're also getting more things that you can do with the powers that you already have at level one level two etc in most cases mm -hmm. so um, you're not just getting those few that you get at level three but you're also getting some additional things that you can now do with um, the previous levels of powers that weren't available to you before is it, which is certain is certainly a fair thing. Um, something else I found kind of in, kind of interesting was the inclusion of a of a point based character trait system. Um, huh? What prompt what prompted putting that in? Um, that's a that's an optional rule, and um, one thing uh, I actually have a. Uh, piece on drive through that's called um, trading. I think it's called trading racial traits, um, and that's kind of where I took this from. But you, to me, it made it made more sense. An optional rule. You, you know, the DM doesn't have to do that if they don't want to, but it it gives the players a little more agency at uh, character creation, and then also. Um, makes it so that you can have a little more diversity in, you know, like if you want to play an elf, but you don't want to um, have the, the archery skill or whatever, you know, that type of thing that they have at the beginning and want to make it a little bit different. Mm. Maybe you want to have wings, be an elf with wings. Then you can, through this system, trade a couple of those traits 
for the ability to have some wings. So, mm-hmm. oh, now a question that I often I often ask when it whenever you're bringing the tech level up to up to this point is the gun question. <laughs> oh, because. <laughs> This was so, as somebody who as somebody who grew up watching Star Wars and a bunch of and a bunch of other stuff. Um, this is a question I would I would I would always have to deal with that one guy who would bring this up, of what of what of why why bring melee weapons in, into a gunfight. Well, if if all you're going to do is is sit. Uh, you know, a hundred feet away from from your people, and and go back and forth shooting each other. Then so be it. You can do, certainly do that. Um, but there are times where you are up and close <laughs> with somebody else, and a firearm is is just not the best option um, for that. It's something you certainly can use. Nobody's saying you can't, but. A lot of times, a a knife or a sword or some other type of weapon is going to be better in close quarters than a firearm. I think a lot of people also underestimate the value of um, rule of cool. Oh, for sure. But I am somebody who has had the mantra of believability is more important than realism. Uh-huh. Oh, because. A lot of time, a lot of times, when it, whenever people talk about realism in f- in fiction, um, it usually it's usually with a negative connotation in my experience. Like they're trying to like they're trying to break down the fantastical. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and in some and in some ridiculous cases, it's an issue of learning when to pick your battles. <laughs> I mean, if you're playing a game where magic is involved to start with, then you're going to have to suspend some sort of disbelief mm-hmm. um, at some point. And so it's it's just a matter of, I guess, how much you're willing to suspend. Oh, yeah. Now, this wasn't in the document, but since we're dealing with something so space-adjacent... Especially with the concept of multiverse, um, mm-hmm. do you plan on putting in support for ships as well as ship combat? No, um, it's it's something that my guess is uh, Spelljammer is probably going to deal with that at, uh, in some form or another. I know it did in the original rules, so I'm assuming that they're going to probably modify their vehicle rules or something for that. And if you want to do that, to me, um, 5e is not the system to use. If you want to have ship-to-ship combat, then maybe step out and use another system for that specifically. Um, I know back in the day we, we played Starfleet Battles all the time, too. That was another thing we did, and mm-hmm. you know maybe that would be or something like that. I don't know if there's a modern equivalent or if people still play that game, but um, uh, there's there there have been some successors regard regarding that. Some of them having less du- less individual dots than some of the sh- than some of the sheets in Starfleet Battles did. Uh, um, I my I myself have used. Um, Battlefleet Gothic because well I'm a, I'm a big 40k fan. Okay. Um, and there's pl- and um, there's plenty of there's plenty of other um options available. Hell, at, I um hell, at one point I even used bat I even used a modified version of Battleship. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, then Battleship Galaxies came along and made my job so much easier. <laughs> but yeah, to answer your question, no, I, I I considered it, but I just decided, yeah, no. If if somebody wants to get into that that portion of of things, then it, 
5e just isn't to me isn't uh, equipped to deal with that so it's it's best at that point to either just hand wave it or use a different system for that particular aspect of the game so mm -hmm. but as far as multiverse travel um how do you how do you work that into the into the setting so the eye itself um is it obviously it, it leads to everywhere um, but in order to get everywhere or anywhere in particular, uh, you have to be keyed to that particular destination. And that's where the, the wardens um, come in. They, no one knows for sure if they either discovered the eye or they created it, but they've been around forever and, and they are the only ones that know how to operate it. And so... What they have are basically a bunch of stations surrounding the the portal, which is a giant sphere. Mm -hmm. And uh, operators then, you, you let them know where it is you're headed. They take a little device and like a kind of like a uh, forehead thermometer, you know, stick it there and, and program in where it is you want to go. And then you, you enter the portal and you exit mm -hmm. where, uh, where you were intended. So. And for some reason, I ended up thinking of sliders, which is probably a deep cut if the, if there ever was one tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I I remember watching that, but it's been so long ago I don't remember very much of it. They were doing dimension hopping hopping with a device that looked like a jumped up remote. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have brought up Quantum Leap, but that's that's less of dimension hopping and more of translating. Yeah. And I don't think I don't think people want to be managing that many character sheets. No. <laughs> For sure. But within the within that I'm gu I'm guessing I'm guessing one of the other reasons to u to utilize this sort of dimension based system is so that um other se other settings can be integrated into the eye a lot more exactly easily. that's that was the that was kind of the, the the point to begin with was what I wanted to do was create a um a bridge that if you maybe your maybe your party's been been playing in forgotten realms for the past however many months or something, and everybody's kind of getting bored with it, but they still kind of want to play their same characters for a while. Mm -hmm. You you introduce the eye, which then allows you to go, you know, you can, um, if they want to, like, join the Abettors League, which is one of the factions, they're basically just uh, multiversal mercenaries um, for hire, and so then... Um, if you, you if you want a more combat based game, you can go just go fight wars on in different worlds. You know wherever that happens, but you want to go to Greyhawk, mm -hmm. whatever you want to go to um, Star Trek, uh, you know anything like that, uh, go do it. And um, that's uh, the one of the best sessions I had uh, in playtesting so far was. The, the party had gone to Eberron uh, chasing a wizard who had stolen some uh, books on time travel um, from the Institute, which is a, basically a giant uh, library. That's one of the factions as well. Mm -hmm. um, and they retrieved those books from Eberron, uh, came back, and then uh, by the end of the, the session, they had uh, jumped over to... Deep Space Nine, and we're fighting Jem'Hadar. So, to me, that's that's just the the length and breadth of, of the possibilities of this, and what to me makes it so intriguing and fun is that just that wonderful chaos mm -hmm. that can ensue. So, yeah. Now, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count? My guess is it's going to come in at between 150 and 200. Um, this playtest document here is, I think, 65-ish or something like that. The, yeah. the, the final book will have the, the GM section is going to be much bigger um, than that. 
which will have very detailed information on each one of the factions. Um, there's going to be, you'll have probably at least a dozen NPCs, um, probably more than that for each faction, uh, adventure seeds, um, all kinds of different things like that. Um, we'll have, uh, so, um, you know, a, a bestiary as well. There'll be, I would guess probably maybe 20 or a couple dozen monsters at least. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh besides that um we'll just add, oh and then uh probably it's some a, a number of introductory adventures just to get give people an idea uh, of what what's possible with this mm-hmm. and i i will certainly be looking forward to seeing how that develops but with all that said i would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you for asking me. It's uh, it's always fun to talk about this stuff. So, mm-hmm. and anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Sounds good. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>